Uh, a lot of you are looking at me like uh, a compliance talk at four o'clock before happy hour. I'm like, oh God. And I'm looking at you like, I have to give a compliance talk before happy hour. We're in this together. Uh, I'll try to make it as painless as possible, which coincidentally is the title of my autobiography. All right. Hi, my name's Justin. I work for Uptix. I've been at Uptix for about two months now. Uh, so how this talk goes probably is how my career is going to go. Uh, so uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Uh, before this, uh, I worked at Intel uh, and Silence. I was an APT hunter at Intel and at Silence. I was a security guy. And as uh, was stated before, uh, I did not succeed in defending them against BlackBerry. So moving together. Uh, we're talking about compliance. Uh, I like this. Uh, let's start with the first set of slides. That was part of the template. Thou shalt comply. First slide is, I think that compliance requirements are written like poorly written decrees from an unloving, out of touch monarch. And to give you an example, uh, here's one I will read to you. Uh, the controller shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures for ensuring that, by default, only personal data which are necessary for each specific purpose of the processing are processed. Like, that, does anyone know where that's from? That's, that's GDPR, like, like who, can, who can do anything with that? But we're gonna try. Uh, uh, so I heard about this really cool tool you guys may have heard of called OS Query, and you can do lots of cool stuff with it uh, on the endpoint. But if you read compliance requirements, there's not a lot of stuff that deals specifically with endpoints with a lot of compliance. Uh, like SOC 2 doesn't deal specifically with endpoints. ISO 27001. They say you have to write your own policies and you have to adhere to your policies. There are some, like PCI, that has endpoint specific stuff and OS Query can help. Uh, but what OS Query can do is give you point in time attestation to your policies or point in time attestation to a specific benchmark. Uh, if you collect all those point in time attestations, you can then do audit time evidence gathering. When an auditor comes into your face and goes, prove it. I want to see 10 random machines from August prove that you adhere to your policies. OS Query can help you do that. Uh, so for instance, let's start here. Thou shalt keep thy systems patched, like every regulation ever. Uh, thou shalt keep thy systems patched is, uh, well, you can do this, select star from patches, uh, semicolon. Uh, it only works on Windows. Uh, uh, everyone here knows this. I mean, if you deal with OS query, you know that you can do this particular query. Uh, it's really not that interesting, and that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. Uh, however, this is slightly more interesting. Uh, this SQL uh, mess that you see here is proof that this is a vendor neutral slide because I took it from Collide. Uh, Fritz is way better with SQL than I am. Uh, and he put together this particular query because Mac OS patches are a lot harder to parse. Uh, you can't just do select star from patches. You have to do uh, all of this to get into a beautiful table that looks like this, showing you that Xcode was installed on this particular date, and it is there. Uh, again, this is something you can do, but it's not all that interesting. Uh, however, Mac OS can help you out a little bit. Compliance idea number two. Thou shall scan the Wi-Fi's. If you've read from the book of PCI, uh, chapter 11, verse one, it will say that you have to scan your Wi-Fi networks every quarter uh, to determine if there's anything that's not supposed to be there. And that usually means that your networking people are gonna be running around with a laptop, looking rather frantic, trying to determine if something is supposed to be there or not. Uh, and that's great and all, but did you know you can do that with OS Query? You don't need networking guys. All you need is a bunch of Macintoshes in your environment because OS Query has the Wi-Fi underscore survey table, which gives you the ability to turn on Wi-Fi survey mode in all your Macs. This gives you the ability to scan uh, pretty much anywhere in your organization all for your Wi-Fis, all from the comfort of your desk. Uh, and you could do this at whatever frequency that you want uh, and then collect that information centrally and then provide that information to your auditor when they require it. I want to see that you've scanned for your Wi-Fi's. I've done it every week for the past year. Uh, however, there's a lot of caveats to this. First of all, the uh, Wi-Fi survey table doesn't have 
all of the information that you need. Uh, and if you are collecting information from machines that don't happen to be on your network, you're gonna be collecting a lot of Wi-Fi information from like coffee shops, or like this is from my house, like the New England clam router. It's not all that super interesting. Uh, but another piece of information that you can have is OS Query tells you when machines are connected to specific Wi-Fi's using the Wi-Fi understore status table. Uh, so you know all your Wi-Fi SSIDs and all your Wi-Fi network names. So why don't you just use OS Query to determine those machines that are on your network, use the signal, the signal to noise ratio, to determine which ones are closest to the APs you're interested in, and then collect all of the information from around those machines. Let's say you take the 10 closest machines to an AP, then you turn on the Wi-Fi survey on those 10 closest machines, and then you just collect that information, and you move to the next AP, and then you move to the next AP. What that does is you've just Wi-Fi surveyed your entire organization from the comfort of your desk. Another piece of cool uh, information you can get from this is you can start just collecting the names of these Wi-Fi's and find out what's normal in your environment. So when something isn't normal, you can spot it. Or if you know that, for instance, in my home, observatory is the network that I connect to, but I have all of these other uh, Wi-Fi adapters. If I have a machine in my house that all of a sudden the Wi-Fi underscore status table uh, pulls up that it's connected to Xfinity, but still reporting into OS query, then it's now connected to a rogue AP or connected to an, uh, a Wi-Fi that I don't control or I don't have any information on. And that's something you can do investigations on. Um, here is that query. Uh, so basically using a subquery, all right, subquery. This uh, basically tells me only uh, do a query from machines that are on my Wi-Fi network and then only give me Wi-Fi networks that I can legitimately connect to and that gives me a list uh, of all of the Wi-Fi's in my areas. But you have to collect it to make it useful. This is where if you have OS query at scale, running on all your Macs everywhere in your environment, you can use this to do your Wi-Fi scanning. All right, thou shalt govern thy data and processing, lower GDPR of Europe land. The uh, thing that I read to you earlier in the stupid voice was Article 25 from GDPR that says you have to control your data uh, where it sits in your system, where it is being processed. A lot of companies are gonna try and sell you a lot of products to solve that particular requirement. And most companies have settled on DLP being that requirement. They wanna sell you a DLP product so that you can prove that you're controlling personal information as it moves through your system. Uh, uh, in OS Query, well, I notify an FS events plus OS Query plus a hot mess equals file integrity monitoring, which is another solution to this particular problem. If you know where your data is located and when it changes and when it moves, then you can, uh, govern the data as it moves through your system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, file integrity monitoring, uh, the file events table, yeah, file integrity monitoring, it, it only really makes it slightly more palatable, palatable. There's a reason why you don't see billboards in airports for people doing uh, file integrity monitoring. Those companies, whew, this product, uh, file integrity monitoring is a beast. How many people have it implemented? Anybody? How's it working out for you? A lot of monitoring, a lot of, Fidgeting, yeah, <laughs> it's a pain in the behind. Uh, and it's super 20 years ago. Wow, is this 20 years ago. Uh, there's no way that anyone really wants to roll file integrity monitoring now. However, if you add file integrity monitoring with Yara, you get kind of a DLP. Yara, for those who don't know, and there will be a great talk on this tomorrow, Julian's doing a great talk on it, uh, so uh, please stay tuned. Uh, but Yara is basically a way to carve files for strings. Uh, so if you have pieces of sensitive information that you know exist in your environment, you can create Yara rules for those pieces of sensitive information and then run them against your entire enterprise to find out where those things exist. Uh, again, not super useful in that particular context. However, oh yeah, uh, Yara is, uh, makes people who understand regex feel like they're useful again. How many, how many people understand regex? Oh, happy hour is gonna come for you soon. All right, um, um, I, I love regex personally and that is usually to my shame. All right, uh, it's also, Yara is built into OS Query. It's just a table. There are two tables that you can use, the Yara table and the Yara underscore events table. And let's go through them now. Uh, first is, this is what a Yara rule looks like and for those regex nerds, oh jeez, 
regex nerds, uh, you're gonna critique this and tell me how uh, unoptimized that is. It's actually very optimized, thank you very much. Uh, but basically, Yara just takes, uh, it opens up a file, it looks for the file for this particular string, and if that string exists, uh, alert. And what it looks like in OS query is something like this. Uh, select star from Yara, the table, where the path is, and this is the path to where I want my scan my files, uh, path where I don't want to scan my files, and this is the signature file that you just saw on the screen looking through those files for social security numbers. What is wrong with this query? Eric. Every, what? every file. <laughs> every file. Going to the process table instead. This double parentheses means scan every subdirectory, and what's gonna happen, we learned that Watchdog is probably gonna kill the crap out of that and blacklist it. Not super useful. Uh, this right here tries to deal with that issue by at least removing the default hard drive name for Mac OS, but again, it's not really gonna be that useful. But in this particular case, it did find something in my very limited test window on my uh, SanDisk 250 uh, drive. I had an untitled RTF that happened to have an OS uh, uh, social security number at line 16. So it can work, but we can't use it in this particular context. Let's try tuning it a bit. First of all, when we're dealing with DLP, we're dealing with uh, the idea that data is gonna move out of your environment somehow. And how data is gonna move out of your environment that OS Query can help with is with USB drives. So how do you find USB drives? You can do it with OS Query. Uh, this takes uh, the uh, block device table, which is anything your computer thinks it can write to, and uh, compares it or joins it with the mounts table, which is anything your computer thinks it can write to, and it gives you the uh, path for which that is mounted on your system. So now I know where files are located in USB drives on a particular computer. If we put it all together, we can take that subquery uh, and find all of the USB devices, uh, then append the wildcard to it, uh, run it through Yara, and all of a sudden I'm only running this on USB drives. What's wrong with that query? It, it, it's not mounted as USB though. Uh, what's wrong with this query is that this may, this may return multiple results uh, instead of just one. You may have multiple USB drives plugged into it, but the like statement won't run wildcards uh, or, or multiple wildcards, so it's only gonna give you the first USB drive, which may be useful, maybe not, but this is just a proof of concept that you can automatically scan USB drives with OS query when someone plugs it into their particular drive. But again, not super useful for a DLP. Well, the second table provided to you by Yara is the Yara underscore events table, and this allows you to attach to the file integrity monitoring part of OS query to make file integrity monitoring more useful. So the file pass part of this particular, this is an OS, uh, OS um, query.com file. Uh, this file path enables file integrity monitoring, use the iNotify or FS events, depending on what operating system you are. And this line attaches uh, uh, Yara signatures to it to those particular file folders. So you can, in essence, monitor when files are changed on USB drives using Yara, effectively giving you DLP when someone moves things on and off of a USB drive. Now this is really cool, but it has its limitations. Like, is this gonna open up a zip file? No. Uh, is this going to deal with encrypted files very well? No. But it's a good way to get started with doing DLP-related things and answering that compliance question. By the way, I totally flat stole this from the uh, OS Query docs. Hmm. Number five, thou shalt render what is known to be unknown. Book of NIST, 852. Uh, a lot of compliance regulations want you to use a standard, and Book of NIST 800-52 is the one that everyone likes to use. Uh, in that is the thou shalt not use SSL v3, uh, thou shalt not use TLS less than version 1.1, thou shalt not use MD5 and RC4 as your SSL ciphers. Uh, how many people have full control of every single web server in their environment and know exactly which ones are running what SSL version and what certificates? Anybody want to attest to that? I'll give you the first part, but not the second. Uh, all right. Uh, however, if you have OS Query everywhere, you can do this from the comfort of your desk. How do you ask? First of all, uh, where do you find your web servers? 
They're everywhere. Devs could just pop them up open everywhere and you wouldn't necessarily know it. They could start running some backend code that all of a sudden became production because it just started working really well. But then they, did, they put a, a web certificate like from Let's Encrypt on there and it expires in uh, three months and all of a sudden that now backend production process goes down and no one knows why except for that one developer who left for a really cool job somewhere else. Um, this allows you to find where all your web servers are, at least the web servers that are running Apache or Nginx. Uh, by looking at your computer, finding all the open ports, figuring out what process is attached to those ports, and then filtering down for the ones that are running Apache or Nginx. Now, if your environment isn't running Apache Nginx, like for whatever reason you're running tiny web server or something else, you can change the, the, the line here. But basically, the first things first is find where all the web servers are in your environment. And here it was on mine. Uh, here are HTTP 80, port 443 running here. And what I have is the command line that was running that particular uh, uh, web server. And in that is the configuration file that that particular uh, port uh, web server is running on. Uh, that is really interesting. What can I do with this information, Justin? Uh, I can parse the crap out of that configuration file to determine whether or not all the right settings are there to make sure that I'm adhering to NIST 852. How do we do that? There's a thing called a Gaius. A Gaius, I think it's a Gaius. Is it a Gaius? Anyone? A Gaius? A Gaius? Augeus? I'm going to pronounce it wrong the whole time. All right. Augeus. Uh, Augeus is a configuration parser. It's an open source configuration parser. Uh, basically, again, for those regex people, it makes them feel super important. It's a bunch of regex that tears apart uh, configuration files and dumps them out in table format and then OS query eats that table format and spits it out for you to look at. Um, it uses these things called lenses. Lenses are just a collection of regexes and rules to use when parsing that particular file and uh, OS query comes with a bunch of default lenses uh, pre-installed. Oh yeah, it's built into OS query. Uh, the lenses look like this. For those of you who like regex, here's that happy hour, right there. Oh, wow, does anyone, does anyone, can anyone read that? Yeah. Really, you got that? All right, memorize it. It is, it is a test later for your drink, for your happy hour drink, all right. Um, but unfortunately, when you run a Gaius against the Apache configuration, you get this nightmare. This is a nightmare. Uh, because a Gaius is awesome in parsing configuration files, but they didn't parse it in a way that makes uh, things human or machine readable, because apache.com files are really not machine readable. Uh, so they did the best they could. And let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, this is the uh, section inside the apache.com for virtual host number one. In our particular example, this is port 80. It doesn't have SSL on it, but we're just gonna go ahead with it. Uh, the, the uh, feature that they wanted to enable is proxy preserve host. But how did they enable proxy preserve host? Well, that is down here in argument one. How the heck do you deal with this? If what you're looking for is what is the result of this particular key, and there's the value of that key, when those are separate complete lines in your uh, SQL database? Well, challenge accepted, and Fritz didn't do this, I did. Um, this takes the uh, configuration, first it scans for all the open HTTP ports, and then this split right here, because I saw where the configuration file was in the command line, I used this split to extract it. This is extremely brittle and will not survive anywhere outside my lab environment, but my version of OS query I was running does not have the regex match functionality of the SQL select, so uh, I wasn't able to write a regular expression to use a more uh, robust parser, so don't use this split split, but uh, figure something better out. Uh, but basically, I just took that Agaeus thing, and I, uh, again, did string, uh, this is a string concatenation, I grabbed the uh, SSL cipher suite um, option from within the HTTP, HTTP config, and we get this particular result, showing me that in fact I have high and medium enabled, and I've disabled MD5, RC4, and triple des. So I have attested to the active running configuration of an SSL web server on my network at this particular point in time, all of the uh, uh, NIST 800-52 um, um, 
ciphers have been disabled uh, and only running what is supposed to be running. There's another um, key inside of the Apache config file called SSL protocol, and that will tell you if it's running TLS or it's running SSL. Uh, you can do the exact same query and just replace it with SSL protocol, and you'll get the values for whether that's configured properly or not. So I can attest to, at this point in time, that a web server that I didn't necessarily know was running on my infrastructure was running the proper SSL configuration. And if I take that and I store that uh, somewhere, then I know that I can attest to it when an auditor comes. Um, but wait, there's more you can do. Guess what else is built into OS Query? I know, it's right there. <sighs> Curl is built into OS Query. Curl allows you to do lots of cool things with OS Query. And actually, I only mean two cool things with OS Query. First, it allows you to uh, test whether a website is up or not. And you can do, this is kind of neat. Uh, if you want to find out if a machine is on your network or not, uh, you, especially if they're like via VPN and you don't know all your VPN uh, IP addresses, you can uh, just have it curl for an internal website that doesn't exist externally. And if you get a 200 result, you know that particular machine is on your network. So curl can be used via OS query to do that. But we're talking about SSL here and encrypting stuff. So curl also has a table called the curl underscore certificates table, which will tell you lots of information about certificates that are uh, in your domain. So let's take that web server example where there's a web server that we know is running SSL, but I want more information on the certificate that was running on it. So you can just run this particular thing, which takes that opening port looking for HTTP or Nginx, uh, it then appends localhost with the port that Nginx was running on and then grabs the curl certificate information from it, including the serial number, the issue organization, and the valid to date, whether it expires. It looks like this. And what you're now looking at, if everyone is eagle-eyed and paying attention, you'll notice that this query does not at all match that query. At all. Why is that, Justin? Eric knows this. Don't know this? All right because there's a bug in curl certificates right now uh, where it will not return results on 100% of your SSL websites. Uh, the bug is known, it is getting fixed. This will get um, uh, worked out eventually. And when it does, you can, at whatever frequency you want, collect all of the expiration dates for all your certificates in your entire environment. You can create alerts to tell you when those certificates are about to expire so you can get them renewed so you don't have any SSL problems. Uh, and any of your infrastructure. You can tell if someone does some monkey service with your certificates, like if they accidentally replace it with something that isn't secure, or if someone even replaces a certificate in your environment somewhere, you can detect it via the fingerprint. So this is a good way to, again, attest to and assure that you are uh, uh, maintaining uh, valid SSL on all of your internal uh, product stuff. How are we on time? I still got five minutes, right? All right. Then I have a bonus decree. Thou shalt attest to everything all the time, or at least for one year. Um, so being able to do all of this has a problem. Being able to collect all this information has the problem, and that is the point in time problem. You're gonna run these queries, you're gonna collect it somewhere, and those queries have the problem that if you go back to look at them, all the dates that you saw, all the information you were, um, is really a, uh, a snapshot in that particular moment. And if you want to run a report on them, you have to do a lot of date math. You have to do a lot of back-end processing to determine whether it was valid or not. And here's an example. Thou shalt verify all Apple provided software is current. That's a thou shalt inside of a thou shalt. This is the most boring inception ever. All right. Uh, you must maintain uh, that this is CIS benchmarks. You must maintain that Apple keeps everything updated. And this is the way CIS uh, recommends that you test that. You grep the apple.com software update and the response should be in the last 30 days. So if I was collecting just generic information from all my Macs, let's say the preferences table, which is in OS Query, select star from preferences, uh, I would get every day or every week uh, a report back at when's the last time this particular machine was updated. So if an auditor comes in and says, I want to know this five machines in August, whether they were within compliance or not, and you go back, but the date looks like this. And that date was only valid at the point in time this particular query was run. It's not valid today. 
So you have to do date math to determine if that was 30 days from the day that query was run. Um, that's not super useful. That's gonna make the auditor do a lot of additional work and they hate that. And the one thing you don't want is an auditor really mad at you, uh, unless you give them food and water and stuff. Uh, feed your auditors, by the way. They'll do better for you. Um, so you can do better than this. Uh, you can write your queries to handle that logic for you so you don't have to do it later. And here's what that looks like. So I'm doing a query where I am now doing the math, the 30-day math within that query, and if that date of value is within uh, 30 days of now, then I'm going to just output true in a column. Uh, if not, I'm gonna output false in the column, and then here's the last full successful date. So basically, I've done all of the determining whether something is compliant at that particular point in time inside my query and storing that in my central database. So now all I have to do is go show me uh, this machine's compliancy and it'll just spit out a table that shows compliant, 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 true, 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 false, 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 false. And that's what it looks like. CIS key 1.1, last, last successful date, the value, was it compliant? True. Now the auditor doesn't have to do date math. You don't have to figure any of that stuff out later. It's just sitting in your central store, whether it's Splunk or Elasticsearch or some other product, uh, sitting in your tr uh, store in that particular value and you can go back at any point in time in your data set and just pull out it was it true or not at that particular point in time. And I believe I'm done. Thank you.